Singapore Budget Conversations, only on Money FM 89.3. Brought to you by UOB. Alvin, uh, good morning. You've been living here since yesterday? Yes. Uh, <laughs> this is the third time, I think. <laughs> uh, we also have uh, Chi Wu Hong, Head of Tax, Market and Solutions at KPNG. Good morning, Wu Hong. Morning. Good morning. Welcome here. Uh, and Ang Yut, a good friend of ours, Vice President at ASME. You're also a business owner. You run your own consultancy. Good morning. Good morning. All right, guys. Let's uh, let's get right into it. Um, let's go around the table. You've had a night to sleep on it. I'm sure opinions have started to change and evolve. Could you describe the budget in three words? Let's start with Wu Hong. Well, I have not enough sleep yet. <laughs> we were panning through the night. So the budget yeah. is described as not yes. enough sleep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Talks aside, I'll view this as a people's budget uh, where the much anticipated and very generous Matica generation package of 8 billion was handed out mm. uh, and coupled with the 1.1 billion bicentennial bonus, uh, which consists of GST vouchers, personal income tax rebate, topping up of younger Singaporeans, you will save and post secondary accounts and a one-off CPF top-up for older Singaporeans. All these are, I can say that, uh, government giving unpaused to Singaporeans before the Chinese New Year period lapse. So I'll help you. Government give angpao. Three, <laughs> sort of three words. Uh, Elvin, what about you? Three words, if you Probably can. Probably I will be a bit different from that. Sure. Um, our guys, we put out a report and one of the three key words that we highlight is maintaining fiscal discipline. Okay. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Angit? Yeah, looking from the perspective of uh, you know how the budget um, reaches out and deals with uh, SME matters, we we consider it as a continuation um, at current pace. Continuation at current pace. Yeah. So no brave soul has said the three words election this year. Am I asking? Let's get let's you get into it. <laughs> uh, Wu Hong, we've got a question for you uh, regarding KPMG's wish list. Yeah, now KPMG's wish list, uh, Wu Hong, has been centered around the potential of the budget in helping to jumpstart the next leg of Singapore's smart vision, smart nation vision. Now, how much closer does this budget take us to that? If you read our KPMG wish list for budget 2019, it actually focuses on key players in a smart nation, being enterprises and people, and how we can deepen our capabilities with the support of partnership. So these ideas are generally in line with the budget 2019 announcement. But budget 2019 could have gone a bit further to advocate a more holistic application of a smart nation through three areas, which I think is uh, digitization, enterprises, and quality of life. On the first front, digitization, I think some mindset shifts are in order, but probably the only set in motion now, which is the defense, digital defense added as a sixth pillar of total defense. Okay. Okay. So among businesses, there's still a huge gap between digital transformation and cybersecurity transformation, with managing cyber risk still an afterthought process. Expertise is lacking in many sectors, especially in areas such as threat, intelligence, and cyber crisis management. Secondly, in the area of enterprise, I think we, we need to have an extra nudge to, to help spur the next stage of growth in economy. Uh, that could be done by extending tax grants and other incentives to cover deployment and implementation costs of new technology in the areas of digital payments, mm-hmm. blockchain, cloud data, and analytics. Third area, on the quality of life, the Matica generation package does reflect the government long-standing commitment uh, to, to have a stronger united Singapore. What seems to be lacking is a push for a more sustainable environment. Uh, we were hoping that the government could drive up uptake of greener real estate sector mm. through policy initiative uh, to help boost supply and demand for green properties such as incentive for making buildings greener. So that we did not see happening. But overall, there's still more room to take Singapore's smart nation to the next level. Uh, and I think this will require more sustained policy attention and industry investment. I think this will be probably seen in the next budget also. All right. Well, Wuhan, thank you for your thoughts. Uh, Alvin, uh, UOB's wish list was titled The Need to Take Measures Early mm-hmm. uh, to Ensure Singapore Has Enough Revenues to Meet Its Growing Needs. Do you see that happening in this latest budget, Alvin? I think in this budget, right, um, just uh, jokes aside. Sure. <laughs> In terms of um, when you look at it, whether this is pre-election, right? Uh, I was told that one thing that you might take it as a there wasn't too much tax increases. Yeah. 
Well, so, they kind of did that last year by prepping you for yes, potential. But there wasn't days. any much. Yeah. So, uh, depending on you seeing it, whether it's a cup half full or <laughs> half empty, it could be a good way of... Of course, there are the Medeca ba- package mm. that we expected, uh, but it was in a very... It was um, delivered in a very sustainable manner because it came in less than the Pioneer package and very much in line with what markets were looking at the numbers, give and take the... Uh, just below the pioneer package of uh, eight uh, nine billion, this one's around eight billion by fully when it's fully de- uh, deployed. Um, in terms of other measures, right? Um, I think things that we are looking for, for example, like a sugar tax, yeah, didn't we really, about this. yeah, didn't really come true. Perhaps it is uh, something that they need to look in more in depth and have a more efficient way of trying to implement it. That could be uh, that's reason one of the reasons but of course in terms of the um i think healthcare needs things like that we also see it feature quite uh in a big way in this budget and also that's also the i think the the, the biggest amount that we see probably from the medeca and also from the in some parts in the bi, uh, bicentennial package itself um at the same time, if you we follow all the measures, while some of the measures looks very gener- uh, looks generous, it still reflects on the very fiscal on the very fiscally disciplined approach to budgeting. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, you would, let's uh, uh, turn our attention to the SME space. Now, you had a lot on ASME's wish list. Could you just give us a quick sense of? sense of how this budget addresses some of the th- uh, the, the items on your wish list? Um, did you see things that you were really hoping for? And um, did you have a chance to get some feedback from your members mm. um, after the budget announcement? Yeah. So the our feedback um, and our wish list actually centered around a few things. Um, first was really the digitalization efforts. Mm. We felt that um, you know we could sharpen, we could actually speed up and um, improve on the digitalization efforts to spread it from just purely product and solution um, centric to also uh, process change. Now, so far, based on the budget, we haven't seen much of that. We have seen some extension of packages, and we have seen. Um, you know, like um, EDG actually being extended for another, I think, three years. But um, we don't see any specific actions in that area. Um, the other area is internet internationalization. And in that perspective, we do see some uh, movements um, at strengthening our overseas note points. And um, at this point, it's actually quite broad. So we are not sure um, how does it pan out. So I think some of the the directions... We have to wait till later when the committee of supplies actually, um, you know, get clear about the specific plans. Um, in terms of uh, workforce development, um, we wanted to look at how SMEs could actually be empowered to allow their staff for, to go for training, because you know, you you know, a lot of SMEs are actually running very tight um, schedules, manpower, and sending them away is going to be a bit. Tough because um, yeah, you know, you're you're running a lean ship. You yeah, can't afford rarely. someone to go away for a couple of days. That's right. So you know what we suggested was really um, allowing SMEs to have certain budgets to actually train people for for, for online training and causes that they could do as and when. Um, we see that there's a focus and there's actually some direction along the lines of uh, grants in that area. So I think that's a good thing. Overall, um, you know, the dependency ratio uh, being reduced is not a good thing for the service sec- sector, you know, especially when they're dealing with multiple things. But at least we have a, a early warning so the, the different sectors can actually de- um, prepare themselves. So if you see the overall the budget is actually... Less of broad-based grants. In fact, there's, there's a lack of any broad-based um, help. But it's actually focused more on um, identifying and focusing and helping the higher growth companies. So that's what, you, if you see the broad, broad direction. So w- there's always been an, an, uh, a criticism that perhaps more could be done to grow homegrown SMEs because after all, in, in, in this internet age today, you could be a two-person startup and then three years later, you're a grab. And yeah. that's literally an, uh, 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 an example that has happened. Uh, it was just uh, 
two two person startup five years ago. Today, it's a multi billion dollar company. Yes, is that something you think that should be addressed in future budgets? Well, currently, if you look at it, there is a focus on um, on startups. So on on that, you have some focus. But what's not maybe being addressed? Um, it's really the existing SMEs that already have businesses and they're trying to actually transform themselves. So it's, we, we got to rely, we're relying on the existing grants that's you know, from the previous years to deal that. We're having a post-budget 2019 panel with Alvin Liu, Senior Economist and Senior Vice President of Global Economics and Markets Research, UOB. Chi Wu Hong, Head of Tax, Market and Solutions, KPMG, as well as Ang Yit, Vice President of ASME. We'll continue after traffic. So we've tried our best to digest everything, lots of details on budget 2019, and we'll try to get into the economic front as well as some skilled workers uh, in this uh, next bit. Uh, Singapore expects to spend $4.6 billion over the next three years on new and enhanced economic capabilities measures in Budget 2019 and to support Singaporean workers. Of course, Budget 2019 has introduced three key thrusts, deepening enterprise capabilities, deepening worker capabilities, and of course, encouraging strong partnerships. Uh, let's take a look at some of these ideas, okay? It includes the Scale Up Singapore program. So this will partner with private and public sectors, and it'll work with aspiring high-growth local firms to identify and build new capabilities. Uh, a pilot innovation agent program will also be launched that provides a pool of experts to tap on. It's it's almost like a mentorship. Uh, I, I'm good. Uh, and, and, and diving into the SME front, um, good enough? Well, um, it is it is actually a step in the right direction. Yeah. The, um, for us, in terms of uh, really seeing whether it really works, is that you know when more details actually um, show up. But we always say that the challenge. Right now, it's not just about solution. It's right. about a lot of SMEs dealing with process change. Now, okay. if the current um, schemes that's being rolled out can address the process change, that would definitely help a lot of SMEs. And that's what we want, really want to focus on. And for us, we will be actually looking at how the budget plays out and how that actually deals with these particular issues that SMEs mm. are dealing with. Mm. Now, in terms of scale up, then that's definitely something that a lot of startups would would, um, would welcome because that really allows them them to to actually accelerate themselves. Wu Hong, there's um, um, this is addressed at you. Um, there was a push to further deepen the pool of smart patient capital to grow Singapore SMEs. Now, on this front, $100 million has been set aside uh, to set up the SME Co-Investment Fund 3 to help in the efforts to scale up and internationalize. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, my thoughts are this is a right, right initiative. Uh, if you recall, the SME Co-Investment Fund 2 uh, has very good take up rate and uh, the outcome was very good. So here comes the SME Co-Investment Fund 3. So the, the rationale is that government recognises there's a financing gap for SMEs and these schemes uh, is actually an extension to help them access funds for their business growth, uh, expansion and also uh, as investment in automation, just like what has been offered, as a, for example, as a equipment leasing in the automation support package. So this will go a long way to, to help co companies, SMEs to raise funds for their operations. Uh, I'd like to get the thoughts of everyone. This one stood out for me while I was listening to the budget. Um, industry disruption, okay? So one of the announcements has been getting quite a bit of a reaction. Um, basically, uh, the services sector will see a reduction in the dependency ratio ceiling. Uh, in other words, the number of foreign workers it can hire will gradually be reduced from 40%, then to 38% next year, finally 35% in 2021. Um, you know, amidst all the goodies, there's this thing there. How much is this going to impact? Uh, first question, how much is this going to, uh, 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 how much of an impact is this going to have and which sector is going to be hit hardest? If I could go around the room, perhaps starting off with Alvin. Okay, um, definitely this is a bit too broad. And we know that services sector covers a lot of different industries. So uh, includes from FMB to, you know, uh, um, specific services like accounting, accounting, uh, convey, uh, lawyers, mm -hmm. and even um, architecture. So that is really quite a blunt tool in terms of trying to ask for. It's to me, it's like a carrot and stick. The carrot is of course to make people do get them to do digitalization. Yeah. To then this is obviously the stick. 
and hire more Singaporeans, yeah. it's supposed to help yeah. as well, right? Yeah, this is obviously the stake. But Alvin, you, you, you touched on a very good point because f- f- services is so broad. So in the F&B sector, perhaps, yes. there's a real push to uh, uh, get local workers and automate. Uh, yeah. But then, if you want to digitalize, the other problem then lies in the fact that you need specific skills, which perhaps you need to import. Correct. And then, so that is the dichotomy and then... Yes, this is perhaps too broad and I've heard people who suggested maybe they need to make it slightly more specific to certain sectors mm, mm. where the, the step to make it automation, to make automation, right, is easier while there are some sectors that really would struggle more to do that one step. Yeah. But um, i like to bring forward a, a, a different point as well, right? This is a stick, but this stick does not really need to hit you on the head in 2020. What happens is we they are preparing you for that. And we've seen that in offshore marine where they have again deferred the levies, foreign levies. So I will present to you that this is a stick for you to do something mm-hmm. in your industry. If next year the market turns really bad mm-hmm. and everybody gets really hit really bad, there is still a good chance that this gets deferred a bit further down the road. Mm. But to present the stake is to show you that you should do something yes. in your industry. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, I, I see you nodding in agreement. Yes, I, I, I was sitting next, next to him and I tend to agree with what he said. So this early announcement actually allows businesses in the service sector right, mm-hmm. to plan for any upskilling of existing employee, redesign the work process, and also to invest in automation. But I, some of my clients actually was hoping that the quota will not be uh, stream tightened and, and, and the, the, the ratio will not be tightened also. But in fact, they, they are ho- hoping that certain businesses, uh, that, that there's a relaxation of DRC and SPAS for digital talent, mm. uh, people or talent that we really need in the fintech, data science, AI, blockchain, robotics, cybersecurity, and, and they're hoping that the, the, the relaxation of rules will come in for this group of people, which really we need uh, to help them to teach us or tell, yeah. do, do certain things for, for, our, for, for our economy to automate faster. Although the education system uh, is, is building up this, this area, but I think it needs time to catch up. Yeah. So we are, some of the business was hoping that this will happen, but it did not materialize. Angit, uh, SMEs make up, what, two-thirds of our workforce in Singapore? They're surely affected. Yeah, definitely. And um, I actually echo the, the the views of both speakers before me, right? And um, it's a very broad stake. And the, um, the kind of effect is really across a lot of different industries. And some industries, frankly, wouldn't be much affected mm-hmm. because they actually hire people in the employment pass um, you know, sure. range, which, yeah. which actually it's a, a lot cost uh, cost a bit higher. So what you're going to see is actually, I think, a, a increase in cost as well for companies who really want to con- continue competing. Um, you know, we were hoping similarly that it will be reduced. You yeah. know, that means that you, you relax the, the number of uh, dependency ratio or at least maintain. But now, you know, the direction actually is to tighten it slightly further. Um, so, so that's the, the way it is and we've got to see how it plays out in different industries and that's where we will actually continue to give feedback. Um, one area that we were looking at and hoping that was really that we can allow for labour from source country to be considered beyond seven. So okay. we have seven countries that uh, we identify, Singapore identified that we can sure. hire labour from sure. and there are seven countries and we, we think that, you know, in the light of the global market changes, we can consider more than seven countries. And that, that's something that maybe, you know, we can put forward for the next budget. Mm. You know, Alvin, I want to address an issue of manpower. I mean, we've touched on this briefly as well, but uh, let's drill in specifically to something called the Professional Conversion Programs, which mm. we've had since mm. 2007. Now, over 100 have been launched since then. And this year, new ones will be rolled out relating to new growth areas. And Wei Hong, uh, 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 Wu Hong, you alluded to this in terms of blockchain, embedded software, mm. prefabrication. Now, how will this help the men? power crunch in these hot areas? I think Wu Hong has already put out a quite good point is that if you even if you roll out programs like this and in education, right, it doesn't happen overnight. I mean you throw me into a school, right? I don't become a coder tomorrow. See. So it probably takes some time to go and lapse through and especially if you can identify that these sectors are really the hot sectors, yeah. are they driving growth? I think um, we look at fourth quarter growth, uh, GDP growth 
services growth was coming down, but then there are some sectors that are propping up growth, and I think Infocom's that which is related to this, is the one that is really growing quite fast despite the environment itself. So if you want to keep that growth, unfortunately, it's good to have programs to try to uh, scale up people, to reskill them into these areas, but to magically transform them into <laughs> this mm-hmm. into this employment, right? It is um it's uh, it's it's really more Cinderella than in than than fact. Uh, we were hoping that definitely you can do it on both ways. You have to change, the, you have to have these programs, but at the same time, you have to bring in the 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 talent itself to yes. to 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 accelerate the whole process of growth in these hot sectors. But uh, with the tightening itself on this on the for these services, uh, they may actually also bring back some some yeah. some development. <laughs> Gentlemen, we need to take a short break to get into traffic as well as a finance update. When we return, we deal with the question, is this an election budget? Stay tuned. (laughs) Good morning. It's the 19th of February. It's our post-budget uh, discussion here on Money FM 89.3. Uh, let's talk about the social front of things. Lots of goodies. I'm very excited with this next question, right? Um, bicentennial bonus, taking advantage of the whole so-called so-called SG200, uh, tax rebate as much as $200, uh, families with school kids, they get top-ups in their EduSafe. Looking at all these goodies, I know there are a lot more that that I might not have mentioned. I do apologize for that. The Medeca generation mm. package as well, right? Um, gentlemen, do you think people are saying this sounds like a, a bit of an election manifesto? Having had the overnight to think about it, does it really benefit everyone? Is it really an election type of budget? Can I go with Alvin first? <laughs> You've had more time to prep. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, first off, right, uh, yesterday we did talk about it and if we were to describe three words that were absent, right, in our view, right, from this budget was, there was a lack of uh, wow and awe. Yeah. Okay. It's, the, the things were there, but okay. I think no one really go, wow, or like, that like mm-hmm. really took them. The, the, the fact is that, um, of course, we have that bank settle, no... Package we had that uh, Medeca package which was already prepped for. Um, by and large, if I were to put my finger on whether this will be an election budget, I would still think that it's for this year, right? Yeah. I still think that it's fifty fifty. Okay. Um, the election is not due until April twenty twenty one. So if I were to put a timeline to this election, right, if I look at what happened in Pioneer Generation Package, which was released in uh, 2014 and the elections was called in 2015, if I use that timeline itself, I think there's still a chance that it will still be called sometime uh, in 2020, okay. which, yeah, not, not 2019, may not be 2019. Wu Hong, we were kind of prepped for this. We knew Medeca Generation was about... We knew about this six months ago. Uh, does, do you think it's an election manifesto, in your opinion, this year? Well, it, it, regardless whether it's a pre-election budget or not, if you look at it, a significant portion of Singaporeans actually receive something in this year's budget. Yeah. The Medica Generation Package, Those a lot of healthcare subsidies are given out. Even those people who miss the Medica Package also get some money in yeah. return. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you look at it, if so m- significant portion of the population has gotten something and there's no tax increases in coming up, uh, I would say that uh, it's, it's a real few good factors that's going on here. Uh, wh- whether it's this year or next year, uh, again, it depends on how, how, whether, you know, what, what, what direction they want to take. So there's a lot of talk about sugar tax, uh, yeah. or, or, but it did not happen. Uh, and, and also about e-commerce tax, uh, but all these are being maybe put aside or still maybe discussing. They, yeah, still discussing, right? still mm-hmm. deliberating. Uh, so does it give you any hints of why is this not uh, being implemented or being uh, at least introduced yeah. or being preempted? No. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Again, mm-hmm. your thoughts. 
Yeah, actually, you know, if you look at the the budget and how it plays out for SMEs, mm -hmm. there's very little that SMEs could say, hey, you know, this is awesome for us. So actually, you know, in my view, I would actually go with Alvin's view that this is, while it's a stable budget, it continues the ship in the same direction. There's very little, you know, fireworks and very little things to get at least the SME communities excited about it. Okay. So, yeah. But, you know, um, and gentlemen, let's, let's take a look at this from a different perspective in terms of fiscal responsibility. Mm. Um, this budget was obviously crafted against a backdrop of a weakening global economy. So 2017, we had synchronized global growth. 2019, we are having synchronized global slowdown. <laughs> so growth is really being hit by all these trade issues. So, Alvin, you were forecasting that Singapore would have a small manageable deficit mm. of about $1.2 for yeah. uh, 2019. Mm. But now it's coming at $3.48 billion. What's the significance of this? Again, I think we talked about this yesterday. Right? If Since FY, I think, 20. 2005, right, the budget estimates has always been very conservative and they have always undershoot their target yes. year in. A, so like uh, what happened last year and then the numbers that came out, I mean, it does show that they have, uh, the government is consistently cautious mm -hmm. in their, out conservative in their outlook itself. And of course, growth itself is that, that worry that you have uh, pointed out correctly. And government's growth expectations for Singapore this year is, I think, 1.5 to 3.5. Wu Hong, can I get your views in terms of the tax changes? Were there any th things that you see in the, the, the corporate fund, perhaps some refinements moving forward uh, in, involving REITs and fund managers? Uh, okay. In fact, this year, budget announcement, the tax changes are quite thin. Uh. Yeah, we were trying to go through the annexes, but it was quite, quite little to talk about. But there is a one uh, important uh, change, which is the extension of the income tax concession for Singapore listed REITs. Uh, we all know that we need to continue to promote the listing of REITs in Singapore and to strengthen Singapore position as a REITs hub in Asia. So this extension to uh, 31st December 2025, uh, it will be a welcome move. Uh, and uh, this will establish our, our, our position as a, as a REITs hub here. The other thing that uh, was a, a bit of uh, good news is the announcement of the 50% personal income tax rebate. Mm -hmm. uh, until when the cap of $200 was announced, then we said, oh, so little. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everyone yeah. laughed, actually. Yeah. 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 Sort of chuckled. Yeah. Uh, actually, if you look at it, right, uh, low-income earners uh, with annual income of not more than $22,000 actually don't pay taxes. Uh. Mm. So this cap of $200 is deliberately targeted at the middle income people. Uh, and this cap is deliberately keep low so that it won't benefit the high income sure. earners. Uh, and I think, again, if you look at when there's a past year uh, trend, right? when there's a corporate tax rebate or when there's an income tax rebate, it also signifies that there's an election coming in <laughs> <So> <laughs> in the near future. Yeah. By that 200. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> You're hearing the thoughts this morning of Alvin Liu, Senior Economist and Senior Vice President, Global Economics and Markets Research, UOB, Chu Wu Hong, Head of Tax, Market and Solutions, KPMG, and of course, Ang Yu, a good friend of ours, Vice President for ASME. Uh, Finance Minister Heng Sui Kiet did target travellers with high, uh, Titan Goods and Services Tax, import relief, alcohol, duty-free concessions <laughs> means you can buy less when you return to Singapore. Alvin, uh, do you have a take on this, on what he said with regards to, to, to the travellers? Um, uh, the rest of us are already calculating how, much, how, calculating how much alcohol we can buy when we go on our next <laughs> holiday. Well, um, definitely, it's uh, it could have been uh, in our wish list, uh, not wish list itself, in our expectations itself, we thought that there was a chance that they might actually increase alcohol tax. Yeah. So yeah. That, that didn't come true. So uh, if you measured against that, right, things aren't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But then there's this talk again about how the government has to, to fund costly projects like, you know, Changi Airport Terminal 5. I, yes. I, I remember Jewel was mentioned. Mm. Why do they keep bringing this up? Is it just to remind us, say, we're, we're increasing taxes in whatever areas for a, a reason? I think, uh, but what 
I took away from the sure. the budget is that they are looking at ways for them to take up loans and guaranteed by the government, which I think believe that in infrastructure projects like this, right, that's the right direction to go. The reason is if you put it as part of the budget item, right, you are using current taxpayers' money to fund something that is a 5, 10 or 20 year project that benefits uh, the future. Mm, mm. So it's the, it's, there's an equitability, the equality issue, whether you should actually be taking from the current budget. So putting it onto taking up loans which are guaranteed by government makes it, uh, I, I believe, a fairer outcome. Okay, I want to get the thoughts from Ang Yut in just a while about SMEs expanding overseas. And of course, uh, go around the room and ask uh, everyone's overall thoughts, a summary thoughts of uh, Budget 2019. Uh, but first, let's get into traffic. It's the 19th of February, our post-budget panel discussion. Brian, I, I was watching the uh, the budget speech yesterday from 3.30 to about 5.30, and I imagine the part where Finance Minister talks about SMEs expanding overseas surely got a lot of people's attention because two-thirds of our economy is built by SMEs. No, and, and, and you would, I'm going to be asking you the, a couple of key questions uh, uh, and, and starting off with the fact that, you know, Enterprise Singapore as part of this whole interna- internalize, internationalization exercise will be developing five-year roadmaps with the trade association and chambers to support them with resources such as funding and manpower. Now, we've also signed a couple of FT, uh, free trade agreements recently. Are we seeing the benefits of these trickling down to the SMEs? Yeah, I think, I think the, the perspective of internationalization is actually uh, multi, multiple facets. Um, the, first, the first area I wanted to you know, look at is really, you know, ask me when we uh, put forward our budget paper, one of the recommendations we had was that we, we realized we did a survey and we realized that the uptake of uh, grants and help right from SMEs are not that high especially you know if the, the grant sizes as they go up you know mm-hmm. the number of applicants gone down significantly down to you know one out of a hundred that we surveyed la. and um, we felt that there was an opportunity to right size some of these grants so that it's available to a broader base of people who are interested to go abroad because we realized also in our survey that a lot of people actually were interested to go abroad um, but that hasn't really happened Alter, in, instead, what we are seeing is that, you know, um, the, from the budget, there is a general push to go abroad, you know. Um, and, you know, involving TACs, trade associations, I think it's the right move. Mm-hmm. We ourselves, um, as me and I, I know quite a few other chambers and associations have been going abroad, you know. And establishing note points is actually one of the things that we wanted to um, to do and part of our recommendation. So I think that... that you know, the grants, if we could restructure it, that would really help. That's not really happened. But going abroad is the right direction. Um, lastly, when it comes to the free trade agreements, um, one of the things that we've been lamenting always is that um, a lot of the agreements that's been signed doesn't really trickle down to the SMEs because the ability of the SMEs to actually to, to leverage on that is not so high. Mm. And we, 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 we were saying the last time was how could we hunt as a pack you know, to have some of the larger local enterprises or GLCs, right, to bring the local companies abroad and and really leverage on mm-hmm. that. Because mm-hmm. collectively, we are much stronger than as individual small little companies. Uh, Ange, this next two questions are about simplifying, all right? Uh, first one being about businesses transacting with the government and the Ministry of Trade and Industry and some other industries have developed this one-stop regulatory portal. Uh, I believe previously it was like 14 different yeah. touch points. Any quick yeah. thoughts on this? Yeah, great. Um, you know, one of the, the costs of doing business is always something that, that we keep an eye on. Sure. Because as, as we try to improve and, 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 and grow the, the economy, naturally friction comes in. So reducing that and reducing that from 14 down to 1 in terms of a transaction portal is definitely a, a great thing to, to have. Um, apart from that, we also want to look at, continue looking at how can we improve um, the process of uh, grant applications, the process mm. of, you know, any kind of applications that the SME has with the government. And that's something that we continue to look at. And I'm going to touch on that because enterprise financing scheme is now being streamlined into eight uh, uh, there's eight existing ones, but it's yeah. apparently going to be streamlined as well. Earlier in our conversations, uh, earlier this morning, you also talked about the fact that there was a need for grants potentially in process areas, and that's clearly lacking. Yeah. Are there, uh, you know, how difficult are these grants? 
um, to apply for and qualify for? What are your members telling you? Yeah, um, you know, a lot of the cases where you look at the grants, um, there are grants that are really uh, simple and designed to be very fast and easy, but there are those that are really complicated, especially those that, that are designed more for larger companies. And in some of the cases, you really need to have a dedicated person or team actually to work on the grant application. Wow, so that then uh, discounts the, uh, uh, the smaller companies from participating. So the grant application scheme, the, uh, the grant application process is rather onerous. That's right. So that's why we, we look at, you know, from our perspective in terms of uh, the budget, we look at whether there are grants designed for the broad base mm -hmm. because these are people who don't have the capacity to have dedicated resources to, to handle that. And then there are companies that are really um, well run where they would get the, the larger grants. So that's a constant process, an evolving process. But yes, you, you're right. Wu Hong, um, would you have specific thoughts on, on this area as well? Yeah, I, I echo Anjit's uh, comments. Uh, grants can be broad-based and targeted uh, depending on the objective he wants to meet. Uh, by and large, the streamlining of the grants and the incentives are, 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 is a good move. Uh, clients have been telling us sometimes to navigate through the complex uh, spider web kind of different incentives uh, can be uh, quite painful. So, uh, and I think also we need they also need special help on what kind of grants are for what purpose. Sometimes uh, they look quite similar mm. uh, and the requirements can be quite uh, different. Uh, I think if we can have the SME centre to, 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 to build up more capability and give more personalised advice uh, to it as to regard onto the grants objective and how to apply for it and what are the pros and cons, give an analysis of the different grants that will go a long way to help the SMEs. Mm. You're hearing the thoughts of Budget 2019 from our panel this morning, Alvin Liu, Senior Economist and Senior Vice President, Global Economics and Markets Research, UOB, Chu Wu Hong, Head of Tax, Market and Solutions, KPMG, as well as Ang Yid, Vice President for ASME. Uh, gentlemen, we've come to that time where it's time to get your overall view on the budget, uh, but let's, let's ask it a little bit differently. How much of the budget addresses what Singapore needs? Who is benefiting the most? The young, the old, the poor? Um, let's start with Alvin. Okay. Okay, first for off, I'd uh, like to add more on the SME programs I've put in, right? I think it is right in the right directions. I agree with my sure. fellow speakers here. Details, some of them may need refinement, but I think this is part of the whole process. They need to go. But one of the things also that we would like to see, and I was echoing one of the uh, speakers that I was talking to yesterday is that you need at the point at, still to complete the journey mm. when SMEs grow right eventually you need to bring them they, they need to look for capitalize, uh, capital or uh, way of funding uh, leading to a uh, listing sure and that leg itself right is I think very much is in a a very missing leg in Singapore's case. Mm. And one of the speakers that I spoke to, I think he put it more pointedly, right? It is quite pointless for you to develop unicorns into big companies, right? Only for them to list overseas yeah. or, or or in the even though the worst case scenario is some foreign companies come and buy them over. So it puts the whole effort, right? Pretty much doesn't put in, it remains within the ecosystem here. Okay. So we hope that there might be more initiatives to not just but grow SMEs, bring but to also bring them to the further the, the second leg of the journey, right? And make sure that retain them within this ecosystem and to contribute to the economy here. So it's more than just like expanding overseas yeah. and what you really want to go through that whole journey. The whole journey and, and then yeah, list it, here and not overseas. It will still be yeah. like your company will still be a Singapore company. Sure. sure. Yes. And that will carry the flagship, the, the brand, the, the branding itself. Yeah. Then um, the other part where I was hoping to see more, which I talked about uh, yesterday, right, was more for the women part of the workforce. Okay. Especially in this age of this aging society, right, and you really need to bring the other half of the workforce more efficiently into the market. And we um, we did see some measures, but hopefully in the more budgets to come, right, we see more measures too that they can. Can bring the 
the women part of the workforce right more integrated and more contributing more to the overall Singapore economy as the whole economy uh, the whole society here ages uh, demographically through the years mm-hmm. Wu Hong any closing thoughts? Yeah, I, I think one, one of the things that I wish uh, was announced but it was not uh, is to really encourage more SME to undertake more research and development type of work. Uh, and although with the expiry of the PIC scheme, the cash components uh, uh, grant has, has been removed. So I was hoping that you know uh, the R&D in terms of cash grant can be given to SME mm-hmm. rather than in the form of tax savings because some of these SME don't pay taxes at the first instance so they will not benefit from it and also the bar for qualifying the R&D incentive could be lower for certain SME sector to encourage them to do more R&D yeah, yeah so like I mentioned um, the a, a lot of budget is really focused on uh, the high, higher growth companies and I think that if we could also look at the broader base and you know specifically there's another area where we, where, where, we, where we spoke about was really about the levies where, mm-hmm. we, where we could look at reducing the cost of SMEs that really benefit us and, and you know even if we hit in the same direction we could still bring some broad base of benefits to, to the SMEs rather than you know purely just focusing on the high growth, higher growth ones. The devil really is in the details and I guess that's why we've got uh, a COS sitting in Parliament next week. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but this morning I'd like to thank all three of our guests. Alvin Liu, Senior Economist and Senior Vice President Global Economics and Markets Research UOB. Ji Wu Hong, Head of Tax, Market and Solutions KPMG as well as Angit, Vice President for ASME. Thank you so much for thank taking you. the time this morning, thank gentlemen. I'd uh, also like to thank, thank our you. producers, Rian Lovabolan and Nadira Zaidi and especially Ryan Huang for putting all of this together. So much research was done and if you want to hear hear uh, these conversations again, or these conversations again, head over to moneyfm.sg and you could download the podcast there. Money FM 89.3